It's official. Jim, I've got a couple of things to, to talk about. Okay. Um, well, uh, why don't we start off with that then? Uh, Gary, uh, Bill, Bill Weir, uh, if he comes up, might have some uh, something to mention about the uh, the update that he sent out, and uh, David has a presentation as well. So uh, why don't we go ahead with um, uh, that? Sorry, that was uh, Randy. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Why don't we go ahead with uh, with your stuff, and then we can go. Uh, David, uh, you can start with your, uh, your presentation. Yeah, I'm still. Uh, and you're off the screen on ours. So we can move your camera? Yeah, that's a good turn. I'll be your okay. cameraman. Oh. You're going to be my cameraman. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I have the great pleasure to. We're just waiting to uh, get the picture. That, can you see me? Oh, you can see my hand. Ooh. There I am. Hello. Nope. You might need to bring it. Or well, you turn, turn the monitor. Move, move the whole television. There, yeah. There. Oh, hey. There hey. That Hello. There he is. So, um, a friend of ours is in the chorus of the opera. And he showed a picture, and there was this great moon shining over the stage and i uh, i said to eva we have to go see this play i also got alex to um send me some photos and like the moon actually features very prominently in the opera and uh let me just uh i have to share my screen don't i that's right that's how this works i know these things um We'll get that, there. Uh, was that the uh, the opera was The Birds? The Birds, that's right. So let me tell you a bit about it. Um, are you going to come up? That's good, that's good. Don't give away the ending, I'm going tomorrow night. <laughs> you know what? The butler did it. The butler. <laughs> so let me just find a more typical that's a fine picture of it okay so um the birds is based on a greek comedy by aristophanes and uh it's about these two humans who are kind of uh they, they want to leave earth and they end up in the kingdom of the birds which lives partway between the kingdom of the gods and where we live down here on, on earth. And I, one of them has the bright idea of convincing the birds to build a citadel to block the smoke of the sacrifices going up to the gods and then the gods won't have any power and then they'll have to supplicate to the birds. Makes sense, right? And, um, and what could go wrong? Uh, now, the opera was started, the, the guy Brownfels, Walter Brownfels, started writing it in 1913, and then he got drafted and fought in the German trenches for four years, and then he finished it. And the very clever people who staged the opera set it in the trenches of World War I. And um, the way that they marked the, uh, when you were on earth is they had this quite spectacular, um, photo of the moon up there. Um, and one of the things I, I want to talk about is, first of all, it's very nice to see this. They also had lots of other astro photography pictures. I don't think... I have any of the nebula and such, but one thing that's really was shocking, or at least um, I was quite impressed, is they were real pictures of the moon, but when they're on Earth, they were the black and white sort of like the moon that we see. Um, I want you to see though that the contrast is much much higher than you'll ever see in your telescope. So that it was a very well manipulated process picture. 
things like in the Southern Highlands, you never see this sort of contrast in the craters. And, and also, you know, the Mare are never looking that black. Um, it, it's, it's somebody did some very clever processing and it wasn't actually a photo, it was a video. And so they often, like in this scene, you actually have sparkling stars in the Mare, which uh, I thought was very effective, but you know, not realistic, but realistic-ish. And then whenever they were up in the land of the birds, and I wonder if there's a picture, do I have a picture? Oh, that's where things got broken up. Well, sometimes it's just the moon, but this is a real picture of the moon, but it's very color saturated. So where you have more iron, it's got the reds and where there's more titanium, it's blues. It's something that amateurs can do, you know, with, with a good RGB picture of the moon, you can push the colors to the point that you can actually see the composition on the moon. Anyway, I was just delighted to see, I don't know what process they went to, to make these things. Those holes are where some birds can fly out. That's the king of the birds there uh, at the top of the um, of that um, platform. Um, again, I, I, I think, especially after seeing, seeing Silent Sky, which also had these great pictures, astrophotography uh, shown in, in, in a uh, stage production. I think uh, it, it's lovely seeing how the amateur astronomer, the professional astronomer, I don't know who did this, um, get, it has made its way into popular culture like this. And uh, as I said, there are also lots of lovely pictures of the nebula when, when things are going pretty crazy. Um, when there was a war going on, when they, oh no, I remember, when the bird said to the humans, don't you dare, um, enter the world of the, the birds, you, you always end up with death and destruction. Then you started seeing like nuclear bombs taking up all over the moon and blowing it up. Um, anyway, it was very well done. And the actual astrophotography, I, I mean, I just love this, this when it's the, uh, the moon. I don't have a whole picture of the moon. Isn't that bad? That's too bad. Very disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I I have no two people in the performance. I also know the tuba player, and uh, I'm going to get him to take some pictures from the pit. Um, there's also this picture. There, there's oh yeah. Then there's the wedding between the ostrich and the flamingo. If you can see this opera, it's really very good. It's quite funny in parts. It's devastating in parts. Um, and it's got a good message. Do I like the music? No, not really. But you know what? There's more to opera than the music. What can I say? So any questions about this? Because I've got another thing that I want to bring up. Where is it? At the Royal, and it's just, it's finished. It's first three performances, and I think there's three coming up Friday, Saturday, Sunday, something like that. Victoria Opera. But yeah, Pacific, Pacific Opera Victoria. Pacific Opera Victoria. Yeah. You said it was based on 1913. He wrote it in 1913. Then he got sidetracked oh. and then he finished in 1918. This is the Canadian premiere. It was kind of forgotten until 1971. It did very well when it came out. I think it was in 1920. And uh, we're guy was half Jewish and when the hit when the Nazis came in he had to hide uh, and he was a very good pianist um, but this was his most popular piece and nobody ever heard of it um, and it's just now starting to, to pick up steam and it, it's you know as opera goes it's no more outrageous than any other <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was as good opera as I've ever seen <laughs> Okay, now um, it was the APOD. I know how I can get it. It is, oh, come on, Randy. I've got, 
Actually, the squirrels get it before that stage. <laughs> <laughs> there, I good stories. I message myself. You can do it. There we go. And it's this spectacular picture of the zodiacal light. This this one was taken in Spain. Hmm. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a picture of it where it was so very clear and. With Jupiter and Venus marking it, you know that it's the zodiac. That's also the Pleiades up at the top of that streak. And the other reason that I'm keen on this is I just saw a YouTube recently about Brian May's doctoral thesis. Now, some of you may know Brian May, big, hairy guy. Usually he's playing a guitar because he was the guitarist for the band Queen. Well, he was working on his doctorate in 1972 or whenever, and um, doing some really, really wonderful uh, measurements of uh, it, using an interferometer to measure the spectra of the zodiacal light. Uh, he developed this very, very clever spectrometer. Um, and he deployed in Italy, got snowed out, and then he deployed it on the Canary Islands and could see the Doppler shift as you looked in different directions along the zodiacal light and showed that um, it, uh, is rotating around the sun. What else did he, was he able to show about it? Um, anyway, he, he did some fine work, but then he took a leave of absence because his band was kind of becoming famous and he ended up, I don't know, being a gazillion millionaire or whatever. And 30 years later, he went back and he finished the thesis. <laughs> and it turns out that there was very little done in those 30 years. There was some developments using uh, space telescopes, I forget which one, but basically the work that he had done was not obsolete, which is really quite something. And he was able to go back, the thing that he had when he, uh, went back to finish it. And this was just recently. Uh, it was uh, better computer analysis and graphics. And the graphics are really good in the, in the thesis. But um, it was top-notch <laughs> data in the early 70s. And he was able to, uh, to resuscitate it and uh, turn it into a full thesis. And he is. Dr. Sir Brian May now. Or Sir Doctor? I don't know the order. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> anyway, it is uh, very, very good science, good story, and a really interesting. I have never seen the zodiacal light. Has anybody here had a chance to observe it? Yes, we've yes. seen it and observed it. Yeah. Way to go. What's your story? Uh, that, uh, Recording in progress. That's interesting. Out of Gary Sedan's place in uh, Arizona. Ah. I, uh, I saw it four years ago. Uh, it wasn't too much light on the ship. Oh, we really? had the dark. Yes. But the ship was the they had it shut down because they were open to do something. Right. Because my experience from, from the Coast Guard oh, ships yeah, I know. is yeah. terrible for. for Light pollution. There's only eight people on the ship. I used to see it every spring in Saskatchewan. Oh, yeah. Occasionally in the fall. And how does it look live compared to this photo? Well, that's that type. I can show you our photo. Oh, I will stop sharing then. And and, and more trapezoidal. Or you could just go to the San Polio. No, 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 no. Don't no. ask me to do that because I. I have a hard enough time figuring out how I'm going to get out of the share. There we go. Yay. 
to see it all the time when I was on the staff at Cerro Tololo in Chile. It's quite easy to see. I was reading a bit about it. Nobody wrote about it till Cassini. They must have seen it in ancient days. Um, six photos. Hey, uh, well, did anybody um, was uh, was somebody going to pull up a, a picture there, or uh, shall we continue on to our next? Joe's question? working on it. Just, Joe's working. Okay. Please remain calm. <laughs> <laughs> Do not adjust your set. Zodiacal or zodiacal? Oh heavens, I don't know. I say zodiacal, but uh, that's nice, sir. So here's John McDonald. Let's see. Oh, you're insane. Yeah. And uh, that's enough. It doesn't say where that is. That was a while ago, 2013. So I didn't see online. I don't see John online. Hmm. No. It's a small crowd today. Yeah. Oh, that's good. So it's a bit more like game. Yeah, worse. Oh my goodness, that's even further than back in 2011. First, his first tobacco light. And is that the Pleiades up uh, the watch right in the middle? Yeah, that certainly looks like it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so who can tell me why it's this season the, that you see it? Rodeo, New mm. There's some reason that this is good time to see it. The ecliptic is more vertical. Yes, it's the orientation. Well, how about that? Here's yeah, it's not as much as the diagonal light. <laughs> yeah. 2015. How about yeah. that? Yeah, that represents pretty well what you would see visually. It's not. It's not really apparent. You've got to really look at it. Uh, this one's mine. I took this with a fisheye. Wow. So I got both and uh, yeah. Yeah, that's me. That's cool. So I got both the uh, Zodiacal Light and the Milky Way. So basically, generally facing south and overhead. And the Pleiades. Yeah. Oh, lots and lots of stuff in there. Yeah. Uh, our and what's and what's on the edge there? Orion's on the middle. Which edge? Was that a planet? On the right. Right edge. Yeah. Right edge. I forget which looks like it's I had mentioned it. Yeah, in 2010. Uh, that was 2017 in February, right about now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, and so if people want to know, it's now considered to be dust possibly coming from Mars, which is flying around the sun uh, in the ecliptic and catching sunlight bouncing off it yeah scattered or reflected ah uh, reflected and the particle size is very small so when they say is that you think it's because the uh, particles are actually out towards mars or that far away it's between earth and mars diameter from the sun in a disk but but, but there's some reason now that they're thinking that the the origin is is Mars, not from the asteroid belt. Well, I saw it in November 2020. J Jupiter and Saturn were right smack in the middle of it. That's really good. So if the zodiac is called the zodiac, why is the zodiacal light called the zodiacal light instead of the zodiacal light? That must be that anti-penultimate syllable. <laughs> you can trick. pronounce it any way you want. <laughs> it just depends on where it's you're cooking the only for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it should be the Zodiac <clears throat> instead of Zodiacal. Yeah. Say uh, Zodiac. So Zodiac. Zodiac. Yeah. Maybe maybe we've been Zodiac. Zodiac incorrectly all these years. <laughs> the Zodiac. What sign are you? Well. Yeah. Thanks, Randy. It was good.
Okay, very good, very good. Um, David, you had uh, something you wanted to present. Yeah, I've got, um, I, I wouldn't say it's so much a presentation on citizen science, uh, but a, maybe an introduction to it and also an announcement of the new SIG. So let me just uh, share this. Okay, so um, I, I guess there's lots of ways of describing citizen science, but I, I've been starting to read a recent book called The Field Guide to Citizen Science. And um, they, they make this illusion in the introduction about the fact that uh, before uh, science was formal and before there were formerly these, these things, these people called scientists, that there were all, always people that were kind of interested in the universe and uh, interested in discovery. So they give uh, two really good examples. Um, they give the example of a cloth merchant. And of course, everybody knows uh, Antoine Van Leeuwen Hulk. Um, I'd forgotten that actually he was a fabric maker, but uh, he originally made lenses so that he could examine the, the weave of the fabric that he sold. And eventually he got, I guess, so obsessed with it that he eventually had the basis or the the beginnings of the microscope. And of course, um, Mendel, who was a monk, uh, did his own experimentation of pea plants and that really spawned the study of genetics. So, um, so much of science um, isn't necessarily done uh, in, in the formal environments. So um, National Geographic has a kind of a nice um, kind of description. Um, it kind of shows the, synergy between uh, uh, professional scientists and, and the general public. And they say that around the world, they said ordinary people of all ages, and, and that's important too, like it isn't relegated to adults, uh, lots of kids do this, uh, engage in citizen science and participating in projects in which volunteers, and of course uh, we are the volunteers, and scientists work together to answer real world questions. So I think it's often coined as, um, Oh, uh, prosai or something like that. So um, there's more definitions uh, in the lower part of the slide. Uh, there's a, a good definition on Wiki, and also there's a NASA Citizen Science site as well. Uh, but tonight I'm just going to give you two examples of uh, citizen science uh, projects that you're you're probably familiar with. Uh, but we can we can talk a little bit about them because I think they're a good model for virtually all the citizen science projects that we have. So the two that I'm gonna talk about is um, the globe at night. And that's where we monitor uh, stars, a uh, number of stars we can see in a particular constellation. And then of course the, the variable star observation initiative of the AAVSO is, is uh, probably a little bit more complex, but I'll get into that. So, in terms of these two um, uh, citizen science projects, in terms of time commitment, I would say the globe at night is more of an example of one that you could all of a sudden just say, oh, I'd like to participate in this. And you could very easily, you know, within half an hour, you, you're, you're gonna learn enough to go out there and do the thing they want you to do. Uh, variable star observation, on the other hand, can be simple. Uh, but it, it it tends to have a higher level of commitment because the observation of variable stars obviously occurs on a time domain. So in other words, you're making observations repetitively over a period of time. And the ease of which you do this, you can start uh, observing variable stars uh, just with binoculars or just with your naked eye. Uh, we did that actually uh, last summer with the beginners group. We actually spotted algal. And we observe that and we observe the dimming of, uh, of algal. Uh, so variable star work can be as easy as say that observation of algal over a couple of nights, or it can be moderate to a little bit more difficult where we um, uh, really observe things, maybe uh, dim things, which really require imagers and telescopes. So that's really the nature of the two different types of uh, citizen science projects. Uh, but what is key in all 
types of citizen science projects is the fact that they give you very concise, clear instructions. So the AAVSO stuff, even though it may be a little bit more complex, it takes place over a period of time. So you don't know need to know the whole thing to get started. And certainly the globe at night is quite easy. So here's an example of the globe at night. Uh, so um, just to give you an idea, uh, they don't require instrumentation. So this is a this is a chance for people to do citizen science without owning expensive equipment. So one of the things that they do is they have a collection uh, through the year. They have a collection of target constellations. Now in February and March, they call these campaigns. Uh, they are featuring Orion and Gemini. So for each of those constellations, they actually have uh, pictures uh, that you can choose from. So it's kind of like multiple choice. So you get to look at a constellation and you go out at night and uh, you look at all the examples of the constellation and you go pick the one that you, you can, uh, the dimmest one that you can see. And then you report out on that based on date time and sky conditions. So it's pretty easy. So this is something that if you do it once, uh, you might want to do, do it all through the year because there's uh, for every month or two, there are new constellations to look at. So I really highly recommend this one. This one's really easy to do. Uh, if you just, just want to get started and you want to contribute. Now, the other thing is, the other thing that's the basis of citizen science is this is a shared data event. So basically the reason why you do this is not just for yourself. Um, you're reporting this to a master database so that people can learn about, uh, for instance, in this case, learn about how dim things can appear or not dim things can appear in areas of the globe. So basically like our sky brightness survey, but done very simplistically. So the other, the AABSO itself is, um, it's a very large organization and they, they have a data archive, which has been sort of contributed by uh, a large number of observers. Uh, they have over 54 million variable stars in their database. So ba basically what they do is, you can actually start off with naked eye type observations and then have bino visual observations to small telescopes, uh, to very large telescopes with detectors. Now, when I joined AAVSO, I, even though I had detectors and such, I wanted to start off at the visual end. So I actually did, I probably did about half a year of visual observation before I actually started doing the one with the detectors. So this organization has been around since 1856. And a lot of the people that uh, participate in this are not formally educated in astronomy, uh, at least at the university level. So they're self or peer taught. And really the, the thing is it becomes a community that has gotten together to share the skill set and also to share the observations that they produce. So uh, pretty amazing. Uh, it's probably the best example I've seen of um, collaboration between scientists, formal scientists and amateurs. So here's a list of uh, various uh, kinds of um, citizen science collaborations. I'm sure many of you have heard of Zooniverse. Uh, the Vera Rubin one is relatively new and they have, um, they have been engaged on doing quite a, a, a large extensive survey of the sky. And they uh, uh, have created this uh, virtual classroom. So bas basically they expose their data to basically citizen sciences, scientists to uh, do, do their own analysis. And of course there's Planet Hunter, Planet Hunters, Galaxy Zoo. Uh, many of these you're, you're probably quite familiar with, uh, but I, I really encourage you to sort of check them out. Um, there's a full um, or or a, a quite a large directory on Sky and Tell. And then there's obviously, this, this this is the big one. This is the science. This is the NASA citizen science uh, URL. And there's also one called Space Hack. So what about us? Okay, so on Thursday next week, uh, I plan on launching the first citizen science SIG for our center. Uh, that will take place on March 9th. Uh, at 7.30. And if you want to participate, let me know. Uh, just send a note to my uh, RASC URL. And 
what I'm hoping that will happen is that uh, members are going to sort of sift through citizen science projects and maybe pick a few that they're going to do and then maybe report back. Now, periodically, I'll be showcasing different citizen science projects at CAFE. And uh, like the Sky Brightness Survey that we did last year, uh, we may even adopt some citizen science projects that we will do as a center. So um, that's basically it. Um, do you have any quick questions? And then I'll show you a quick demo of, um, uh, of a site that I discovered recently. It looks so, like yeah. the most fun of the citizen science projects was the space work. I want to go through the space work. How do we get there? Uh, space warps. Uh, go to this URL. And space warps is one of these in here. I remember that uh, Mallory Thorpe, who gave uh, the talk at the um, International Astronomy Day and at the Star Party, uh, she depends a lot on the, uh, what's it called? The Galaxy Zoo. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very popular. That's been around for a while. What people have been doing is looking at these pictures, these, you know, the, the very deep pictures from the uh, space telescopes and classifying them. And then if they look wonky, then she would go and study them. Hmm. Now, you know, it's interesting you say that. Uh, this kind of predates the wide use of uh, AI. Uh, but uh, nowadays, you'll find that most, uh, most places use AI to front the observations. Like, there are actually so many observations that they have to kind of filter uh, at the top end anyways. And then they still use citizen scientists. I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you an example of that uh, from the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan, actually. It's called Galaxy Cruise, which is kind of interesting. It's, um, it's a citizen science project where people actually observe uh, inter, uh, interactive galaxies, the ones that sort of collide with each other. So that's kind of cool. I can show you that. Uh, a lot of the site is in Japanese, but uh, you'll, you'll get the idea. So should we have a look at that or are there any other questions? Okay, I'll just see if I can bring that up. So I'll I'll play this. I'm not sure this is kind of a more of an ad for it, but I'll play it anyways. You'll get a maybe a sense for it, and then we'll we'll go over some of the pieces of it. Can everybody hear the music? Set sail for the cosmic okay. ocean. You can see various types of galaxies. How did such a variety of galaxies come to be? Therein lies the history of the universe. Let's start on a journey to travel around many galaxies. Yeah, that doesn't really tell you too much about it. It's kind of a more of an ad for it. So you kind of get the gist here. Uh, they're using this theme of kind of cruising the universe, right? Looking at these galaxies. And they even kind of a, let's see if we can find the section here. So these are all, um, all the images, um, are actually from the Subaru on Mauna Kea. Let's see if we can find the... Uh... 
natural intro for this. So they have this um, section here where they uh, actually go through this. Again, this is kind of a hallmark of uh, citizen science projects. They ha have these very short kind of intro uh, kind of demos that tell you what you need to do. And then in the interface, that's where you make choices. And actually in this particular uh, application, uh, they have a, a bunch of um, icons on the bottom. So when they bring up the images, you can actually just pick the right one or or pick the one that you think is right. So they give a bunch of characteristics, like does it have rings? Does it have like surrounding galaxies? There, there's this whole list of checklists of things that you can check off. And that's basically what you submit. So yeah, that's, so that's uh, Galaxy Cruise. Um, there's obviously a lot of um, citizen science projects that are based on planet search as well. So Planet Hunters is... is kind of one of them that are like that as well. So that's basically it. Um, if you want to participate, let me know. Uh, I don't know if there's any more questions, but I'm gonna probably, I'm gonna put those um, directories into the chat so that you can uh, pick them up and then you can sort of peruse them at your, at your own convenience. Great, thanks, Jim. Okay, thank you, David. There, uh, just as a, a point, I know that we have at least uh, one other ham operator here in the, uh, in the group, uh, and I think several more, but, but there are uh, a couple of projects going on. One from NASA for uh, making radio observations during the uh, solar eclipses that are coming up. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, then there's also uh, another one that's involved in uh, doing observations of uh, uh, Jupiter and solar emissions uh, with the radio spectrum. So. Uh, I'll send those links to you, David, and uh, perhaps you can send them out with uh, anything else. To yeah, I'm, I'm just going to throw the main ones uh, out to the chat right now, and people can pick them up there. This David, did you see some differences between Galaxy Zoo and the Galaxy Cruise? They're thematically different, but they're very similar. So, I mean, they all do very similar things. Uh, they basic Now, the thing about the Subaru material... It is um, uh, fronted by AI, so there's there's a bunch. I don't know what happens with the Galaxy Zoo, whether the data has been pre pre digested, so to speak, mm -hmm. but the Subaru material definitely has, because there's so much of it, you you couldn't manage it otherwise. There, so that should be all the the URLs. Okay, Thanks, now, David. Uh, Bill. You had sent out an email uh, earlier today about uh, updates from the uh, National regarding uh, um, the uh, uh, magazine and uh, various other uh, uh, changes that might be coming up to the National Office. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that? I just want to test to see if my microphone's actually working. Yep, you're Is working. It? Oh, okay, because it wasn't earlier, so I had to log out and play with my iPad to get it working again. I don't know, did people read it? Did anybody have any questions? Hmm. Very interesting, and I posted it to Victoria Center's website so that people can read it there if they're not a member of the email list. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if was that letter actually meant for the general public or just for the RASC. I guess that's the question. It, uh, Bill, is there anything there in the note that isn't public knowledge or? Well, I think talking about like the internal sort of politics of the office oh. staff changing and things like that. So I, I don't know. I didn't see anything that looked um, overly sensitive, but uh, no, they didn't. They didn't even mention the names of the staff that have left. The only one they mentioned is Phil Groff. Yes, and that Randy Atwood was filling in. Right. So I wrote Phil Groff just last week about, uh, you know, we had questions from council about uh, board of director 
insurance. And he answered, uh, so like it, there was no mention and goodbye or anything. It was, it was just, he, he gave us an answer and so I think this, he's still well, um, working until the 17th of March. Okay. Uh, Laurie, 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 you would say most of this has been pretty low key, hasn't it? Hasn't been a big fanfare in announcing things. No, that's, I, and, and for some people that's been a, a problem, you hmm. know, is that there, that there has not been, um, like, I was really happy to see Charles Edison's, um, um, um statement Stick. because yeah. it was kind of the first one that we had from the national board that was that was putting some things out chris yeah, you make no more you know more comments yeah. about this so uh so i haven't been on the board you know for since june and you know this latest round of problems just came out of the blue sky for me too um Although in some ways it's not a surprise because uh, um, it's just been, ever since the COVID thing happened, it's just been one damn thing after another with Sky News. And, you know, we had sort of got the ship righted, I think, when COVID got going. Because, um, you know, we had to make some changes then. Um, and then, you know, uh, and I think some of, some of the challenges were have been mentioned in that, that letter. You know, subscribers going down, difficulties getting newsstand sales, advertising going down, need going out of business. It's uh, explosion in printing and paper costs, all this stuff. Um, and and then, and I know some people uh, have been really choked about the way this has been communicated, even though, frankly, um, uh, I thought the presentation given to the last um, National Council meeting was pretty clear about what was going to happen. Um, you know, and that was a couple of weeks ago, but a couple of comments about why that's happening the way it is. Uh, my position right now is that is that I'm the uh, I'm the uh, uh, chair of the editorial board. But for example, when the board, uh, you know, when word began to sort of dribble out that the board wanted to act Sky News, I didn't find out before anybody else did. Um, and I'm also on the board of Sky News, by the way, um, still. And I didn't find out before anybody else. So one of the reasons why they were, you acting kind of weird about saying, oh, well, uh, this is going to happen is because, you know, Sky News is still going until the Sky News board says it isn't. Um, and uh, and the Sky News board didn't uh, meet until last Wednesday. Um, and not everything at that meeting was tied up with a knot. We have, we're going to be meeting with a, a, a lawyer uh, this week to kind of uh, you know, make sure that, that what, what we're doing is all straight and everything else. So, uh, you know, I think there was some expectation that we were going to announce something right after our meeting on Wednesday, and then we didn't until Charles, uh, you know, sent out that note uh, uh, yesterday. So it's kind of it's kind of stuff like that that, that that is going on that it's just, you know, uh, you know, you can't announce that something is happening until it's happening. And sometimes it doesn't happen in the order that you would like it to happen in. So uh, I, I, I hope that explains things a, a little bit. But, you know, I will agree it's it's awkward. But uh, there's a couple of people on the, you know, going around saying some pretty nasty stuff that I take exception to. Um, and um, uh, just uh, a, a couple of things, a couple of people who are leaving. Uh, 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 Samantha, our outreach coordinator, is leaving. And so is Lauren Knowles, the environmental outreach coordinator. And, uh, and then Phil uh, handed in his resignation uh, 
what was it? I think last Tuesday. Um, and then, of course, uh, uh, you know, and it doesn't take effect until uh, March 17th, and then Randy will be in on an interim basis. And I know that the search is going on for a new executive director. I've heard at least one really interesting name. I don't know if that's going to happen. But uh, anyway, uh, and, and you know, uh, uh, Phil's uh, departure, uh, I, I, I don't think it's, it, it's sort of necessarily related to uh, the events of the last couple of weeks. Uh, he did get a job offer that's a bit more in his field, as Charles, I think, kind of suggested in his note, than the RESC. And I must say, you know, uh, Phil is, uh, through no fault of his own, has had a really rough ride at the RESC. You know, uh, when he stepped in, uh, we were sort of going through the, kind of the pre-COVID round of Sky News problems, and we thought we'd settled them. And then we had this whole business with, uh, uh, you know, people in Calgary, you know, uh, trying to ex ex basically extort members of the board and and I think you you probably heard some of this this stuff that's going on, and then uh, a former president of the society going nuts and things like that, uh, making life really difficult. And 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 basically, we kind of laid that to rest on uh, on a weekend, and the following Wednesday, COVID started. You know, and I, I'm not exaggerating the dates. We had we had a board meeting. On, on a weekend in March three years ago, where we kind of finally dealt with, with that whole thing. And then the following Wednesday, uh, COVID gets going. And, um, you know, so, uh, you know, I'm sure there are some things that Phil could have done better, but I, I think he had a, you know, uh, a, a really difficult time. So I, I, I cut him a, a lot of slack and, uh, he, his background is in the social services field, and he did get uh, uh, quite a good offer in that field. So I think that's that's why he's going. So uh, uh, it's just because of my uh, perch where I am right now, I just happen to be in a place to find out this sort of stuff. So uh, if I can answer any questions, I'll be happy to answer them for you. Yes. Uh, I have no idea what you're talking about, Chris. But what I do know is that I received a couple of renewal notices for Sky News that I had given as gifts. And I thought, well, yeah, that's odd because I had, they were multi-year gifts. And so I checked on my, my account on, in Sky News and both subscriptions had been canceled last September for some reason. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know what to say about that. Of course, amongst the many big issues that, 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 the national office has been dealing with is uh is you know uh we're trying to change our computer system and you know because the old one was just creating nothing but trouble and the new one i think i think it's fair to say we've been having a few more teething problems than uh than we would like you know if i have learned anything from being on a national board it's just it's just uh you know, dealing with uh, uh, computer and internet systems, dealing with things that even seem to be kind of straightforward, you you are getting yourself into a world of pain. And I just, uh, you know, when I see these things, you know, big scandal, government wastes millions on computer things, I'm not surprised anymore because I just think of all of the problems we've been dealing with. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry about that, but actually, and by the way, just you mentioned guest subscriptions <laughs> to Sky News. Uh, one of the issues the Sky News board has to sort out is, you know, we have uh, a number of subscribers, not members, but subscribers whose subscriptions will run out before the last issue, you know, uh, which is the uh, uh, April, uh, what is it? The March, April issue, I believe. And, uh, um, you know, so we have to try and make good to them in some form, you know, so we're, we're discussing that. Uh, and that may, that may affect you if you're still owed some Sky News 
I've tried to phone the the telephone number for Sky News, but there's there's no pickup. It just rings and rings. Yeah. Well, you know the uh, you know like uh, another one of the issues with Sky News is that Sky News has been gobbling up uh, national office staff time, and and this is another reason why the board uh, uh, did what it did was uh, because basically you know we were paying these staff to be society staff and they were spending all their time on Sky News stuff. Uh, and uh, and which means the society should actually compensate Sky News, which is a, a separate entity for that stuff. And of course, it's never going to happen. It's just it's just another additional cost. And so probably with staff people already heading out the door, uh, that's the reason why your phone isn't getting answered. So if the if you can perhaps communicate with an email or something like that. To who? I would uh I, well I would send it I would send it to Phil. I mean he's still there and if he can't deal with it he'll pass it along to Randy. I don't know who Phil is but what's his Phil is the executive director of the RESC until March 17th. And his and address is, is Phil P H I L at RESC.ch. And isn't he also on the Sky News board? Uh Technically, yeah, I don't know if he's officially, but he's certainly. If he's not official, it's ex officio. So, yeah. and and you know, as the executive director, he has to spend a lot of time on Sky News. So, he, so he he probably knows where the bodies are buried more than I do. Thank you. Well, a question too for me. I I have a subscription for three years for Sky News. Yes. So uh, uh, aside from your membership. Yeah, beside the membership. So that's that's something that the, the we in the Sky News Board have to discuss. We will, you know, how to how to make good to uh, uh, for people in your position. Although generally what we're doing is, you know, the discussion so far is that, you know, if you've got a separate subscription, we're assuming you're not necessarily a member. So we were going to offer a membership. So. So I'm actually glad you brought this up because I will ask, well, what happens uh, What happens to people who have a subscription, but they're also members of the RESC? I've been doing that for years. Yeah. Well, member, I, I, and and uh, subscribing to the Sky News separately. And then yeah. I recently updated for three years again. Yeah. I'll ask about that. Thank you. Chris, thank you very much. This is not an easy... Uh, role that you've been playing yeah it's not really astronomy so uh <laughs> oh well it's a difficult process for any uh, any organization or any people to go through so uh thank you chris for speaking up for us chris could you explain um who owns sky news is it i i, I just noted the one in the RAS yeah. site and i don't i don't so see it, i don't news, see it listed on sky the news Sky News is a separate entity uh, that was basically set up by Terence Dickinson. You know, and of course, one of the great ironies of this whole thing was, you know, one fine day I got up, uh, uh, you know, and ar around the middle of the day, and this is after I'd gotten some bad news after about a college buddy, um, uh, uh, I get an email from somebody who's heard, uh, you know, on good authority that the board has decided to close down Sky News. Um, and then about two hours later, I get an email saying that Terrence Dickinson has died. You know, this is just the icing on top of the whole cake, you know. So anyway, it was a separate entity. And, and the board of the RESC, and this is when I was on the board, so I'm one of the responsible parties. Uh, was was it six or seven years ago now? Um, uh, uh, bought Sky News because Terrence Dickinson's health was already declining back then, and he offered to sell it to us, and we thought it was a good deal. And uh, and so it is. Uh, it is still a separate entity. We were actually working on bringing it into RESC, so that it was part of RESC. 
but it was uh, a little complicated because of the fact that uh, that the RESC, uh, you know, uh, is a registered charity. So that was that was uh, taking some work. And and then of course this was something that was put on the back burner when COVID arrived. So uh, so RES Sky News is a separate entity, uh, but it has one shareholder, and the shareholder is the RESC. Um, so uh, so the Sky News board is going to kind of you know basically wind up um, Sky News at least you know, in terms of an operating entity. Uh, but um, the RESC is going to be on the hook for, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, a lot of the costs that are left over after that. Thanks. Shame to see that uh, disappear. Um, maybe there's opportunities for another organization or... Uh, yeah, well, so you know... Pick it up. We we are talking about uh, and we talked about this at the editorial board meeting uh, last week. But of course, it was still you know still early days, and you know people are still kind of su surprised and upset and all this. But uh, um, uh, an another thing that Sky the Sky News situation has distracted us from is is the journal. You know, we produce the journal, and I think it's an excellent publication. Um, but it, it kind of reaches a different and some would say more limited uh, audience in Sky News. And so, you know, and, you know, for years, we've been talking about, well, we got to do something about, about JRAS, you know. And of course, most people just get access to a uh, PDF of, of, of JRAS. You can subscribe if you want to pay more. Not that many people pay more to get it, and we we would. Uh, but anyway, there is some talk about uh, uh, getting uh, putting some uh, features from Sky News into the journal, and and that Sky News parts of Sky News might continue in an online format. Now, uh, you know. Uh, Back on those days between uh, the board meeting on Sunday and COVID on Wednesday, we were talking about, you know, we knew that younger people coming into the society, coming into the hobby, are more interested in in on in the uh, online presence rather than the printed presence that, that us oldsters love. And uh, so, so, you know, we were talking about that. And we're still talking about that, but there's there are going to be some technicalities uh, that we have to deal with. Uh, one thing we discovered is that uh, is that we actually don't own the name to Sky News, um, and and to make it even more complicated, before just the, the the history, before Terry Dickinson owned Sky News, it was actually owned by the National Museum of Science and Technology. You know, which is a branch of the federal government, and and it sort of came out as a little calendar, you know, four times a year or something like that. And then Terry took it over and turned it into the magazine. And but apparently the uh, that museum still owns the name. So, <laughs> so if if we want to get a sky, you know, kind of get a a standalone Sky News website, that's what we're gonna we're gonna have to deal with that too. You know, it's just. You know, you know, sometimes life can get so bloody complicated. It's just beyond belief. Thank you. I don't know if uh, if Joe and and uh, and uh, David agree with my comments about computer systems, but I'll tell you, I I totally don't disagree with you, uh, Chris. <laughs> I think I think one of the problems is. You know, we've been moving towards um, kind of non-custom systems, and I don't think that's necessarily bad. But I think when people buy like a a well, I try to remember what they call them, but there, there, there's a name for these kinds of apps where they're made for a certain market, and then they will still the owners will still charge you 
a customization fee. So in other words, they'll take their main body of work and then they will build your organization around it. That works and doesn't work in many ways. Sometimes it works really well for simpler organizations, but when you deal with all our mini organizations across all our centers, we all think we're a little bit different, right? And that yes. is just a death knell when people say that, because you know if we just could get together and say, we're all gonna do it this way, and we're not that special. We're just like everybody else, right? Yes. Then it's simpler. Yeah, and I think 11 years ago when I joined the RESC board, I just thought, oh, you go out and you buy a box that handles all these things, you know, your computer system, and away you go. And I got a very quick and, uh, you know, not happy education about that because, you know, I think practically from the beginning, you know, we were, you know, arguing about the computer system of the day, you know, we had Dennis Gray on the board and he was with one of the provider and yeah. it goes on and on and on. Yeah, sometimes the complex, you know, you you have this fantasy of having the ultimate system, but that should never be in your mind. Just do the basics. And, and you know, like like an example, um, yeah, of, of, the, of the problems, which is which has kind of come up in the, this discussion that's been going on with the centers at council is this whole business about family memberships, you know, sort of uh, <laughs> getting a, a a place where the, we we can run the family memberships the the way they are in our constitution or uh, um, was just driving the computer people around the bend. Uh, we could never have a happy medium. And I, it's really difficult because we set that up for very good reasons, and, you know, including some relating to here, you know, like our situation with the, uh, um, you know, the uh, NRC and access to, uh, to the uh, VCO and all that. So anyway, um, it's just sort of reality running into computer reality. David was talking about vertical market software. That's the term that's used. For this yeah, software. and I, I, I just remembered now, um, there's a term called COTS, which is commercial off the shelf. So basically people often take COTS and manipulate them. There actually are membership programs, right? There's quite a large number of them. Yeah, but it, that didn't cover the basis for what Rask wanted to get out of the system. Right. And so they went with a vertical market that could be customized and uh, that therein lies the problem because it costs a lot of money to do that. Yeah, and it, it presupposes that you've done a, a business design that encompasses all the centers as well that they would agree to. If they don't, you've got separate businesses all across the board. A thing I found interesting is they were talking in Okay, there was a survey that went to all the presidents, and one of the questions was about having uniform cost structure across the country. And it was a difficult and impossible thing for Victoria Center to say that Saskatchewan, which is very inexpensive, and Quebec, which is very expensive, that they should each change the level of service that they're providing. I mean, it's it's pretty clear. I sure hope that the centers that are asking for more money are also providing more services to, to their members. And um, I guess we have to recognize that this is more a federation than a single entity. I, I'm curious to know what it is that allows the Regina Center to only charge six dollars, and while well, the uh, the Quebec was asking for, we're right median in Victoria, but the, it was like a factor two higher in in uh, the Quebec uh, Center. Just all depends on how ambitious the center yeah. boards and executive are, and how much demand they get from the membership. Um, you know, Saskatchewan. For example, may just run itself. 
they don't even have to charge two bucks if they can cover their costs. We're in a similar boat. We have very little expense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And in fact, in our case, our finances, the problem is spending the money, not getting the money. But that's not the case for every center. Yeah. <laughs> no, if we had to pay um, you know, more market rents for this space, for example, we get a really good deal on this space. We get a really good deal from you, Vic, at the moment. Yeah. But we have consciously avoided high expense monthly bills. And then there's there's Edmonton, which which funds some of their outreach programs, sort of lottery funding. Yeah, which we don't do. uh, and Calgary, yes. And, and Calgary yes. as well. Yeah. A lot of Alberta. There's a lot of so there's, money there's a lot of variety and wrinkles there that can't be provided for yeah. in an international accounting system or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, it's it's amazing. You know, I've had the chance to visit various centers over the years and and uh you know it's it's uh the they're all different you go to their meetings and you know like i went to an edmonton center you know and like it was practically they had to spend an hour before they got to the speaker talking about all the stuff they were doing with their gaming money and <laughs> and and uh, uh, sadly, uh, we had a much more generous regime about this uh, uh, with gaming money, um, and uh, uh, and unfortunately, that's changed over the years. Various governments have have changed it to just more money for them. Uh, yeah. Actually, you know, and including the uh, NDP government in the '90s, which I was a part of. I hate to say it, but there was somebody, a very well-meaning citizen who had what I consider to be a boneheaded idea. Uh, you know, as usual, there was, you know, some problem with health care. And he said, <clears throat> well, let's put more of the gaming money into health care and got thousands of people to sign a petition. And the government felt com compelled to accept that. So, so it's people like us, you know, kind of suffered because of that, you know. And of course... All that money that they threw into healthcare, you know that, you know that probably covered about a day and a half of the healthcare system, if that. You know, it's that. You know, um, you know, every government does good things, and every government does boneheaded things, and that's one of the boneheaded things government does, even if well-meaning. I think we could probably go on and talk about this for quite some time. You know the difference yes. between the uh, the centers and uh, rehashing how uh, finances have changed, which and, and there's probably going to be a good place for that. But uh, I think perhaps it might be something to lead to the general the AGM that's coming up. Uh, so I'm going to say, does anybody else have anything else they would like to add? Anything uh, they'd like to present or talk about? Well, we do have some pictures of the comet taken by our astrophotographers and drawn by some or a particular skilled individual. So I could okay. show um, some of those. And Lori, you had your hand up there for a moment. Um, I was just going to say, <clears throat> um, we had a, a really great talk by um, Amy Archer last oh. Saturday night um, of, the, of the relationship between the Underground Railway back in the, um, in the 1800s and the night sky and uh and i would like to propose that we invite amy to come to speak to our group i i know there were a there were a few of us there but not like not not so many that if she was a, if she was invited to speak um i think she would be a really uh, valuable addition to um to put on our on our um agenda at some point that yeah, it like was really, it was very, really cool. Very interesting topic. Uh, that would be so. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure how we go about doing that, but uh, uh, let's see. Uh, would it be Chris, Chris Purse or Reg, who's looking after? Yeah, Chris that's Purse. A, that's good. I will, I will happily hand it off to them. <laughs> okay. Actually, I have not arranged a speaker. <laughs> interestingly enough, it's been other members like Jeff and Margie and. Oh, Luke. okay. Yeah, but I'm. Yeah, I could contact her and see if she'd like. To. No, but she was very good. We should. You you could, Lori, if you'd like. Well, Margie, Margie is right yeah. here, isn't she? Yeah. 
Yeah, I just I just don't know a, a date. I mean, I, I'd be happy to invite her, but I just don't I don't know the schedule enough um, for dates and things. So, I think we have one speaker booked between now and the uh, wrap up in May. So, uh, pretty much everything's open except that one date. So, okay, I will ask her. Books. Yeah, not the thirteenth. Yeah, not the thirteenth next. Month. Right. Not okay. The not the twenty seventh. Yeah. So of uh, March. Rob. March. Brock, you had uh, did you have some pictures yeah. you wanted to show? Yeah, for sure. Thanks. I can share them. So they're a mix of different things. Start pretty much an entire month of the uh, of the visibility of our little uh, yeah. friend. The uh, there we go. Can you guys see that? Uh... Yep. Okay, this first image was David Lee, and this was the earliest one, January 19th. And uh, I don't know if you have any, anything to say about that, David, but it's a pretty wide field shot. Uh, yeah, I- Just a I, teeny I, little piece I'll, there. I'll tell you, th this actually started off as a visual observation, and then it went bad because I, I couldn't see it. So <laughs> I think like many people, uh, we kind of strain to see it from our, in our, our driveways, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I succumbed and uh, dragged out my camera and uh, uh, found it this way. Nicely done. The next image was uh, January 22nd, which was drawn by um, Bill. Uh, and uh, this one was uh, done, it's at, looks like 54X with this Teleview 101 millimeter and um, very nicely drawn. And um, the next one in the row here, I think was the same date by Lucky Bud. And um, this is actually quite nice color on it. I, I don't know his exact technique. It's unfortunate that he's not uh, joining our meetings. He could speak to it, but um, he did a beautiful job. Also the ion trail is more defined than I think any picture, that's remarkable. Yes. Yeah. And this I think, one, I think, was January 28th, actually. So this was getting closer to February. I think he's using relatively fast optics, I think. Yes, that he's using, my understanding is he's got a Hyperstar attachment for his SCT, which increases it to F2.0. So it's an extremely fast astrograph so then the next one after that was um ron fisher who took this one on the 28th as well i guess this one of ron's and lucky's were on the same date and you can see they both had a pretty strong tail and then one day later another shot i guess lucky got out two nights in a row and got this one on the 29th another beautiful shot and then another shot i put in here from bill which was on the same night and it looks like it's getting a little bit more defined bill could you see the ion trail or could you see the the two tails no no i couldn't at all and then that very same night, we also had Dave Payne out with his telescope. And this was his big um, 12 and a half inch um, monster scope. So it's zoomed right into the core. So there's, I think there is a bit of tail. If you look in the lower part of the image, there's a, the tail is there, but it's just so zoomed in that you can't really see much of it. And he also managed to capture a galaxy. It looks like a barred spiral galaxy. I don't know which one it is, but a tiny little image of a galaxy there. And then we've got uh, the same night, Ron Fisher was also out there um, and got uh, his second night of for him and another really nice image showing, again, good detail. And then I've got we go to the next night on the 30th, I guess. Yes, this is the 30th. Bill again, sketching, and I think even more zoomed in from the looks of it, or else it's just getting closer. Excellent detail there. And then Ron again, 
on the 30th. And then Dave Payne, this time with a, a wider field lens. I think this would have been with his refractor. Um, so it was a little bit wider field of view and you can actually, it's, it's I think better in this a little bit zoomed out because you can really see the tail and the color is spectacular in this one. I think uh, Dave said that um, he let us mount track on the head, yes. head of the comet. That's what makes this different. Yeah. And he also spoke about some of the chemistry of it. The yeah, the, the uh, diatomic diatomic carbon. carbon yes. <laughs> I hope there aren't any chemists out there. No. And then uh, Alec Lee managed to get a really nice shot on the uh, on February tenth. I guess we've jumped ahead till February tenth here, and this is actually. I started out this section with the wider of the shots here, but this one you can see um, the comet and Mars. So the comet's over here and we got Mars blaring away there. And then the same night, um, I think this was the same night. Yes, it was. David Lee was also out there and managed to get a nice shot. Now and he has- The dark nebula in the same region. Yeah. And then we jump ahead. I don't want to spend too much time. There's a lot of pictures here, so I'll try to move through them. But Bill got out another on the 10th as well, that same night with Mars. So Bill managed to uh, to get both the comet and Mars in this one shot, and also some of the treetops nearby. And and then it looks like Bill was out. Correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, but it looks like on the same night, you changed eyepieces and went up to 90x and took a closer look yeah. of just the comet. Yep. And that was just one tree in the field. It was just oh, okay. running up. It was the, everything was heading towards that tree. Oh, so this is the branches of the tree. Yeah, those are the branches of okay. the tree. Okay. Okay. I wasn't sure if those are treetops. Nice image. And then we've got uh, Lucky Bud again. Another nice shot by him. And this one, of course, has Mars as well. That's the same night. And then we move to the 11th. It looks like uh, things are getting even closer. We've got the zoomed in, zoomed out drawing from Bill, again, uh, showing Mars. And then another one where he changed eyepieces from the looks of it and got no, 100. That's, that's my 20 inch scope. Oh, OK. That, so this That's was, why it looks so weird. Yes, of course. Because that was just like, that's oh, just. Oh. Right. Fantastic. But you can really see that that um, almost like a blast in front of it, right? Like a, yeah. Yeah. Uh, th this is your fast uh, scope, right, Bill? Yes. Super yeah. fast. That must be a joy to look through. One day I'll come out and join you at Pearson. It's a long drive. <laughs> um. And then, of course, Dan Posey got out that same night. Or no, actually, was this this was the next night, February twelfth. Well, it, at least that's what's on it. I, I don't know if Dan's think, here tonight. I, I think that's out. Is that Deveron or is that Mars? I think uh, I, that's Mars. I think that's oh, Mars. it is Mars. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's too it's too bright to be El Deveron, I guess. El Deveron is the other red thing on the left. Probably oh yeah, there it is. is. There, it, there's the Hyades right there. Yeah. But yeah, this one also, speaking of like uh, Lucky Bud was zoomed in with a really big fast scope, but this was uh, an even faster, but much, much wider field of view. Uh, this is, I think, an F1.4. Yeah, it's a 105, 1.4, 1.4. Yeah. So that's, and of course, this was multiple exposures as well. You can actually see, he he tracked on the stars and you can actually see that comet actually turned into a bit of a stripe because it was actually the tracking mm -hmm. of the stars let the comet essentially trail out a little bit in the image. But from this view, originally view, it's actually quite, uh, you don't notice that and it looks really great. And then another one of Alec Lee, this is super wide field. You can see Orion here. You can see the comet. You can see Mars and Aldebaran and Sirius way over there. 
And then um, the next one is, I think, David Lee again, which is zoomed in a little tighter. And I think this is Aldebaran again. Is that right? Yeah, and the uh, NGC. And 1646 or 47 and can't remember 40, which nice little cluster 1647 cluster. up here yeah yeah yes. i saw it that night too yeah it was cool and then i was also uh, whoop, no, that's not me this one was alec again and then uh, comet here aldebaran and then i managed to get out that finally i managed to get my stuff set up and got that same night and then I was a little bit more zoomed in. You can see that same uh, open cluster, I think NGC 1647. And uh, that was, I think, on the February 14th. And I didn't get out till later that night for good reason. But, uh, and then I managed to actually squeeze out one more night on the February 23rd, but you can see things are starting to fade away. It's getting smaller and more distant. And that's the last image. Oh, very nice. What a wonderful community project this was. Mm -hmm. you, you know, it's surprising when the weather was so bad mm -hmm. that we got we got that many views. Yeah. Well, apparently, Bill has way more clear weather than the rest of us. I, <laughs> I, I didn't even I didn't even put all my shots into that folder well i even took my, a my last observation so was the 24th <laughs> okay Bill's, Bill's I, caught, I caught it three times with aldebaran in the same field of view but bill you said on saturday night that you were except for when you were using the 20 inch you made a point of using the same field of view the whole time to get the time series and i'd, I'd be really interested to see you know, quantitatively, how how uh, different in your sketches, how, how uh, much it increased and decreased, and see whether your light curve has anything to, like uh, what what the quantitative light curves are. Some of it had to do though that there was moon or no moon. Yeah. So that's a problem because like the last two nights, I had hope. And last night I went out again. I tried on Saturday night and then I tried on Sunday night and had fails because of clouds in the way. Although last night I saw the, a feature I'd never seen before on the moon and I can't find any reference out there to it. It was like a Cheshire grin in the dark. I didn't did, you, did you try? <laughs> no, because I was so focused out of the corner of my eye watching oh. the area of the sky I needed to see to see if the clouds cleared there. <laughs> what time were you? Did, what time were you it, on it? I I went on that um, NASA site where you can bring things up. Yeah, on the yeah. Moon, and that was at 0400 hours today. Hmm. So yeah, it was okay. really. And it's right next to to the, it's just south of Short, the crater Short. I'm trying to figure out what it is. It's it's so interesting. Let's see if I, I can, I've got it on my photos because I screen captured, but I don't know how to share. Um, what I've figured out is it's the outside crater rim of A-L-B-A-T-E-G-N-I-U-S, whatever that is. As a Jetius is, yeah, and there's a nice um, catena that comes out of there. It's a, a, a string of, of craters. Yeah, it was just really strange, but it was like a little, when I had it at really low power, it just looked like all these little, there was like four teeth in a grin. It was very cool. You said it was oh. Cheshire, but that's a cheese. So maybe the moon is made out of cheese after all. <laughs> Wallace and Gromit went wrong, Reg. 
<laughs> yeah, it's just west of Abu Feda. Just west of Abu Feda. And that's east west on the moon. Yeah. Not our Randy knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> It stood out prominently, just like the X would, only it was just these four white dots. It was very cool. Well, if it has never been named, maybe you can you can name it. Now it's tracking down when to figure out when it'll be a game. Mm -hmm. So Bill, another thing you said on Saturday is that the advantage you have over the astrophotographers is you can be out and back inside in 15 minutes having made your observation. Yeah, because our eyes are way better. As much clear sky. Cameras are better overall, but not in how much they can gather in a very short period of time. We're not as nimble. Yeah. Okay, um, so if any, nobody else has anything to say, I think uh, it's coming on to about an hour and a half now, so uh, it should be just about time to wrap things up. Uh, does anyone want to add anything before we uh, close? Sorry. Yes. Um, Randy, do we know anything more at all about what's happening on the 30th of April? Oh, heavens, yes, let's talk about this. Ah. Um, so, on April 29th, the Friends of the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory are going to hold International Astronomy Day uh, events up on the hill. And then on the 30th, we'll have our uh, full community uh, event at the Bob Wright Building at the University of Victoria. Uh, there will be quite a call for volunteers, but we hope to do the same sort of thing that we had at the museum for the last several years. Unfortunately, the museum is using the space so we don't have access to it this year. Uh, so we'll want to have an information desk and a children's area. Uh, we're starting work getting speakers. Um, Karun will set up uh, solar viewing up on the roof because, of course, it's going to be beautiful and sunny that day. Um, but and we'll we'll get all the different uh, astronomy community there as much as possible. Uh, as soon as we have a bit more flesh on the story, then we can start advertising and getting the the word out to to the media. Thank you, Lori. And then uh, let's also talk about the AGM is going to be online, not hybrid, because it makes the votes easier, um, on the 13th, two weeks from today. And then we're hoping to hold a social dinner. And sounds like the uh, date that works for a lot of people is going to be two weeks after that, the 27th. So that would be in lieu of Astro Cafe. And uh, it will be just a nice fun time, but it won't be with the speaker, which is uh, a tricky thing. We will hand out the award certificates um, at that time, but mostly let's get together. Let's be, let's be a Nice, happy community together. So that, that's the goal. And then maybe we'll do more things after that, but that, that will be our, uh, in, instead of one evening, which will be a uh, dinner and AGM. Gary. I am supposed to be the volunteer helper outer guy. So uh, who do I contact to see who needs what volunteers? I will include you in the correspondence from now on. We, we, there's about five, six people that have been 
in emails. Okay. And uh, the answer is th there's nothing official yet, but uh, <laughs> what we really would like is um, somebody's going to be kind of the hands on coordinator on the day. Because uh, Jeff Pivnik and I both wanted to, and we're both not going to be there. So uh, we'll, we'll do some work ahead of time, but we need somebody who's going to kind of just be on top of things on the 30th, Sunday the 30th. Okay, that would not be me, but do you want me to start pestering people about it, or is that something you're going to be doing, or what? Uh, let's continue this offline. Good, sounds good. Yep. Thank you. Okay. I'll be telescope show and tell. You can just completely forget about that aspect. Yay! <laughs> Do we have any ask any pictures show and tell people already? Oh, again, too early. We we, we just got the venue. Okay, I'm looking at Joe's picture. And and uh, we have the venue, but we don't even know how much we're going to have to spend on it. Okay, fine. Okay. So, uh, Gary, I have the master list from last year, so we'll kind of have a look at that once we nail the menu, the venue. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Did anybody have any, anyone have anything else to add? Nope. Sounds pretty quiet out there. Going once, going twice. Okay, well, I'd like to say thank you very much to everybody for coming up tonight. We've uh, covered, covered a lot and Thanks, uh, looking forward to uh, next week and then also to the uh, the AGM on the 13th. So that'll be an excellent meeting. So anyway, good night all. Yep, good night. Good night.